Welcome to Chapter 7, Carbohydrates and Amyloid. In this chapter, we're going to be looking over some special stains. So this is going to be our first time really diving into specials. And the way we're going to approach that is I'm going to go over the some of the basics behind the things we're actually trying to stain. So in this case, uh, carbohydrates and amyloids. Uh, and there's a lot that we can kind of go into uh, with these with these compounds, and I, I really don't want to kind of drown you out in uh, all of the specifics, because in reality, as a technician, you really don't need to know that much about the chemical structure of carbohydrates and amyloids. Um, for the most part, you just need to know what functional groups you need to get and how do you get them. And once we go over the, the basics, then we'll go through some procedures. And as we're going through those procedures, I'm going to, once again, kind of pare them down a little bit. There's a lot to cover in this chapter, uh, especially when we're doing our kind of uh, draw together activities here, which I really, uh, really suggest that you follow along with if you're an interactive type of learner. Um, so I'm just going to leave out stuff like the uh, concentrations and the, the exact, uh, you know, how many grams of this, milliliters of that to put into a solution and really how long to do things, mostly because in practice, uh, if you go between different textbooks, the, the amounts are going to differ a little bit. And when you're in your actual laboratory, you're mostly likely going to be looking at a procedure that was made in-house. It's probably adapted from a textbook and you're going to be following that. So there's really no use in memorizing the specifics of how many milliliters of this or this exact concentration. Uh, things we might look at are maybe pH, because that tends to not really change across some of these. Uh, but yes, for the most part, you won't need to know those, and you certainly won't need to know that level of detail on the exam. So let's start with carbohydrates. For the most part, you're usually going to see carbohydrates represented uh, with one of these rings. Usually you're going to have some functional groups attached to it. Uh, the formula for carbohydrates tends to be a variant of C6. H12O6, and that meaning that a basic structure is going to have some multiple of that. So uh, you might see like a C12H24, O12, be like a disaccharide. Um, so if, if you're looking at things like these, you're looking for some kind of multiple of that. Um, typically, if you see one of these and they don't have any of the uh, and the double bonds here, then you're most likely looking at a some sort of carbohydrate molecule. And that's just for, for those of you that haven't had uh, a intense biochemistry or otherwise uh, uh, practice in chemistry, it's just in case you see that and you won't be uh, quite so confused. Now, typically when we're looking at carbohydrates in, in human tissue, it's going to come in a few different variants. Uh, it can be by itself. So you might have carbohydrates that are kind of linked together in a polymer. And in the one that we see in, in humans after fixation is glycogen. And we're not going to try to write the entire uh, structure of that because it's pretty big. But glycogen is essentially a bunch of carbohydrates linked together. And what that allows for is uh, it essentially allows for energy storage. So when your body needs energy, it will cleave off uh, a piece of that glycogen and uh, convert it to ATP, and that ATP will then be used for energy. Uh, carbohydrates are also stored uh, attached to lipids, so that'd be glycolipids. And it can also be attached to proteins. This would be a glyco protein. And within glycoproteins, we're going to see a, a separate class called acid mucopolysaccharides. Now, I won't worry too much about knowing these in detail, just knowing that they are going to have different staining properties. And that's really what you're going to have to know for the exam. And we're going to go into a little detail as to uh, why they're so important in the body. Now, you might be thinking that there are also many other carbohydrates that are involved in uh, human physiology, and you'd be correct. 
uh, things such as glucose. Glucose is pretty important, but in histology, it's it's not so much included because during the fixation process, we get rid of anything that is uh, dissolved in aqueous solution, including glucose. And I'm sure there's a lot of other ones that we're going to miss out on that are more likely to be picked up in the clinical lab where things are still dissolved in things like blood serum and things like that. So we're mostly just going to focus on these things that survive uh, processing, because if they're wiped out during processing, then we can't stain them. Let's talk about these different groups in terms of how they stain, because really that's really what we're looking for, is what's going to show up uh, when we do different stains on the tissue. So under neutral poly or polysaccharides, uh, these are, as the name suggests, neutral. And so we're going to use a stain that stains neutral saccharides. So PAS, which is periodic acid shift, which is what we're going to go over very soon. These are PAS positive. That's what you want to remember for neutral. Even if you forget, forget the polysaccharides part or somehow you know mess this part up, just remember that the neutral stuff gets stained with PAS and is typically negative when we do acid stains for carbohydrates. So all of our PAS stains will stain this. Our acid stains will leave these alone for the most part. Our next group is our acid mucopolysaccharides. These are also referred to as uh, connective tissue mucins in some texts. And these are the opposite. So these are going to be PAS negative and acid stain positive. Which makes sense. It says acid in the name, right? And the neutral one, our PAS only does neutral stuff, and our acid stuff only does acid stuff for the most part. And so these are your two opposites when we're talking about staining today in terms of carbohydrates. Our next group are the glycoproteins, and these include epithelial mucins. Now these can be a little bit variable with uh, PAS, so you don't want to use these as a control for your PAS stain. Um, but they do stain really well with mucicarmine. I mean, we get into glycolipids. These are mostly set as a subgroup because they tend to stain a little bit differently. They do tend to be acid positive and PAS variable. So it can be kind of positive or negative, uh, and that's why they kind of have their own group because they're not really uh, clear-cut like these two. So now we know a little bit about the carbohydrates that we're going to be looking for. Uh, I'll tell you that the whole purpose of special stains for carbohydrates is to look for either the presence or absence of a car specific carbohydrate or to tell the difference between a neutral or an acid uh, carbohydrate or a specific type of mucin. And that's going to be important in, in some, some diagnostics. So let's get into our first one. It is commonly called PAS. Uh, typically, if, if your physician asks you for it, they're just going to say, you can get PAS on this. And PAS stands for periodic acid, which is essentially one reagent, and SHIF. So it stands for the, the main two main reagents that we're going to be using in this stain. And so let's just get into the, the whole principle of this. In a periodic acid shift, you're going to take your tissue and you're going to oxidize it with periodic acid. And then we're going to use this shift reagent, which is very special in that it, it uh, reacts to aldehydes and turns them kind of a, a pink color and then we're going to counterstain it with whatever we want to counterstain it with. So a lot of times you'll see this PAS and you'll see another letter here. So a standard kind of, uh, if there's nothing special going on, you'll see a PAS H. And that H is for hematoxylin, which we are already familiar with. Sometimes you'll see a PAS F, in which case that is PAS fungus, which means we'll use a different kind of counterstain. We'll get into that when we're starting to stain for microorganisms. So today we're just going to concentrate on the PASH. Something special to remember about any of our PAS stains is the S, and we want to, that's our shifts. 
we want to test that shift's reagent before we do any kind of hand stains with it. And essentially the way you do that is you take a little bit of your, your shift's reagent, put it in a separate beaker, and just add some formalin to it. So some 37 40% formaldehyde or 10% formalin. And when you add that to the shifts, it should rapidly change color. And it should change color to kind of that a reddish purple. And if it does that, then it's good. Um, but if it takes a long time to react and it's a very, very deep, kind of more of a blue purple, then it's time to change your shift reagent. So just keep that in mind before you even run this, um, and maybe once every few batches, you want to check that shift's reagent to make sure it's working correctly. Because if it's not, you can actually have a false negative on a patient just because the shift is not working the way it's intended. Now, another way to ensure that the R results are not influenced by the quality of our reagents is to choose a very sensitive control. So in this case, for a PAS, we're going to use kidney. And the reason we use kidney is because when we go to stain it, we're going to try to stain a glomerulus. And if the basement membrane shows up positive, it only shows up positive if the shift rea uh, reagent is really good, if we did the, the reaction completely right. So if you have kind of a, a not great shift, maybe it's degrading, it will not stain, and you'll get a negative on your control, at which point you'll know that you either you know, did something incorrectly in your procedure, or maybe your shift is going bad. And that's really important because you, even though you could use something like a liver, because it has a neutral uh, polysaccharides in it, a liver will light up even with a really poor Schiff's reagent. And so what I'll tell you, the pathologist is, oh yes, this is working great, even though it's lit up, um, you know, you can be having a really bad uh, Schiff's reagent. So if the control looked positive and the patient looked negative, uh, you know, it could be really big trouble. That could be a false negative just because the liver is so reactive to that Schiff's reagent. So. Try not to use liver, it's not great practice. Uh, try to use kidney. Now we can finally get into kind of the fun part, right? This part everybody is waiting for. Um, so we're gonna start doing the, the whole draw together thing. So here's our, our virtual kidney. It's not real great because, uh, well, I don't gross, so I don't see them very often. But let's just say this is our kidney. We're gonna take a piece of the cortex. Okay, just gonna move this over here. And let's say we zoomed in on that so that we actually saw a, the glomerulus and all the convoluted tubules around it. So let's get our whole picture here. Okay, so in the middle here, I'm actually going to start with our basement membrane, which is what's going to be uh, colored at the end if we do everything right. And then here we have the rest of the glomerulus. So it's just kind of mushed around there. And we have a bunch of tubules surrounding it, right? So it's a lot of uh, single live epithelium and base membrane around those. And the, that best base membrane will also light up, but um, people just tend to look at the glomerulus, uh, my guess, is because it is the most sensitive of these. I'm not gonna do the whole thing here because that's just gonna kinda of waste our time. Um, I just wanna have some things here that are also going to be not as darkly stained as we go through. Okay, so we, we've had our PAs gross part of the kidney, put it through the processor, <clears throat> and then we embedded it in paraffin and cut our microtome, and now we have an unstained slide with our glomerulus and all of our other components here. So what's next? Well, this is going to be the same for almost all of our stains. So you can kind of just assume this step from this point forward. Uh, we're going to treat this the same way that we do a hematoxylin and eosin stain, where the slide starts covered in paraffin and that paraffin stops our reactions from working, correct? Uh, when we did h and E's, we had to get rid of the paraffin first and get it down to water. We're gonna do the exact same thing with every other special stain with a few exceptions, which we'll note. So just take your unstained here and melt it down. Typically it's a 
good thing to do first so we don't lose the section. It kind of fixes it to the slide. Then you put, put through xylene, a few changes of that. There are a few changes of graded alcohols. So you might do 100, then 95, and then you want to put it in water. And at that point, this tissue does not have any paraffin on it. It's just kind of raw and it's ready to go. Well, not raw as in unfixed, it's still fixed, but raw as in doesn't have anything covering it or interacting um, to uh, counteract our stains. All right, so for those of you that are following along and doing this interactively, you want to go ahead and make a new layer because we don't want to try to erase or draw on top of our sketch here um, because really you're not going to see a lot of this on an unstained slide. You typically don't see the outlines of anything for the most part um, unless you're using a really uh, good light contrast. So at this point there's essentially nothing here and we're going to add a layer so we don't mess any of this, these uh, outlines up. So the very first step is pretty boring visually. Uh, you're going to put your slide into periodic acid. And what that's going to do is it will interact with all the neutral polysaccharides and it's going to take any of the free ends of those and turn them into aldehydes. That's the important part of any PAS reaction is you have to have aldehydes uh, ready to react. And that's what our periodic acid does. So we're going to oxidize all those free ends, turn them into aldehydes and get them ready for the next step. So after we put it into periodic acid, then we're going to wash it with distilled water, and that's just to get rid of the periodic acid. Next, we're going to put it in our shift reagent. Now, when we put it into our shift reagent, it is not an instantaneous reaction. Uh, so we're just going to airbrush a little bit of this light pink on there. And this is going to hit most parts of the, the kidney. Um, your kidney control is going to just have just a little bit. And the reason for that is our shift reagent is a, made up of a dye and sulfurous acid. So it has basic fusion, which is our dye, and sulfurous acid. And the reason those two are together is because that basic fusion is this color by itself. So it would just be a, a dye and you would be dyeing everything um, all the time if you didn't put the sulfurous acid on it. So it kind of makes it a little bit more specific when you go to stain. And so we add the sulfurous acid to it. The reagent itself is usually kind of like a milky white color and that essentially masks the dye. And so when it attaches to our tissue, some of that sulfurous acid starts to go away. And that's what gives us some of the, the pink color is just a little bit of that sulfurous acid has gone away, but not enough of it to completely unmask that dye. So our next step is actually really important. And that is our potassium metabisulfite. And what our potassium metabisulfite does is it gets rid of all the excess shift. So anything that is not directly connected to an aldehyde is going to be washed away before we unmask it, uh, or mask it even more than it already has been. And so that's also not all that uh, impressive visually. It doesn't look all that different because most of these pink spots are things that have already been connected to. And so here comes the, the most important part of this whole thing. Uh, as far as the shifts goes, and that is the washing and running tap water, typically warm water, uh, really helps this reaction along. And when we do that, it just starts coloring in everything. And it's just going to be kind of this bubble gum pink color. And that's going to get on essentially all these pieces in kidney but then the part that you're really looking for here when you're looking to see if this is uh, a valid control or not it's gonna be right around this base of membrane and it's just gonna be that really deep deep pink right around your base of membrane and you also see this uh, to a lesser extent 
uh, kind of on the around some of these tubules as well. But really, what you're looking for is on the the glomerulus. And so, if that does its thing correctly, and you'll see the base membrane of the glomerulus as well as the uh, so these internal components will be fairly deep as well. But it's really that basement membrane that you're looking for. And if that is that nice, deep uh, pink color, then you've done things correctly. So now you've done this, uh, what's next? Uh, so you've run under tap water, you know, you've gone rid of any excess stuff, but really all we're seeing are these carbohydrates. And usually our doctors want to see more than just carbohydrates. So we are going to use a second stain, which we're familiar with, which is hematoxylin. And if you are following along with the drawing, you want to add a layer here. And the reason we do that is because we just stopped reaction, right? We washed away anything that should be reacting. Anything that we add up to this point shouldn't interact with anything that we did before. So let's say we just like, you know, splattered a bunch of this on there and then wash it away then our other stain will still be here because this was here first now it is possible to stain something that competes has a higher affinity for what we just put down uh, but in most cases that's uh, that's not gonna be a thing so we put a new layer here I usually use texture spray for nuclei we want to get that uh, hematoxin purple down there Granted, this is a very, very low magnification, so it's going to be a little bit messy. I'm actually not all that uh, impressed with this one. So, you know, use whatever tools you like. Uh, the important thing is that we remember these steps and that we, we oxidize our aldehydes. And then we add our shifts, which did the a little bit of reacting, right? As some of the sulfur acid had already left. Then we add our potassium metabisulfite to make it more specific and to get rid of any excess. And then we wash it in tap water, which essentially finishes the reaction for us. Get rid of this excess spray here because it looks terrible. The nucleus doesn't look like a nucleus, does it? Um, yeah, so then we added our hematoxylin just to get some nuclear staining. And that's it. That's essentially it. You, After that point, you wash off the excess hematoxylin and run it down through um, alcohols to xylene and then cover slip, which is another step that you'll see almost all the time, uh, except for things that tend to run, uh, run out in alcohol. But for the most part, when you're done staining any special stain, just run it down through graded alcohols to xylene, <clears throat> and then go ahead and cover slip. That's it. You just did a PAS, uh, and it's it's super common. Uh, some folks do this routinely on uh, liver biopsies, and you're all, we're going to see the one that we're going to go over next as well. A lot of times on on livers. So go ahead and get rid of some of these layers because we're going to do a brand new stain. Um, and in fact. We're going to get rid of our line drawing because we're going to use a different control for our next one. Oh, one other thing to note with any kind of PAS reaction is that you can't really run it on tissue that has been fixed in glutaraldehyde. And the reason for that being when you fix tissue in glutaraldehyde, you're essentially placing aldehydes all over the tissue. So when the Schiff's reagent touches it, then it's going to react with essentially everything or it might even resemble a pattern that looks like something pathological, so you might get a false positive on the tissue. So <clears throat> for the most part, you want to stay away from any tissue that has been fixed in glutaraldehyde, or if you know that the tissue is going to might need PAS down the line, don't use glutaraldehyde as your fixative. So for our next stain, we are going to look at a PASD, and that D stands for diastase. And so what diastase does, uh, it acts a lot like amylase uh, does in saliva, where it'll break down glycogen 
in a in tissue when we were looking at it. So if you wanted to see uh, if something is what is this the PA stain looks with like with and without the glycogen, then you would use diastase. Now, as I mentioned before, we're going to use a different control for this. Uh, some folks will use two separate slides uh, for this, and that's, that's usually the most common way to do it, is you take a piece of liver, which, as we said before, contains a bunch of glycogen, which isn't great for PAS by itself, but it's really good for PAS diastase because of that glycogen. So when you put it through a PAS reaction, even if it's with not a great shifts reagent, it's going to light up really well. So you have kind of a positive slide that's going to have be super, super positive, and you're going to have a, a diastase slide, and that's going to be fairly negative because all the diastase is going to break down all the glycogen, and so that will essentially make it uh, not light up at all because there's, there's nothing there for the shift reagent to react with. And so for this case, uh, we're actually going to use a control of endo and ecto cervix, which I find really interesting because uh, if you have a slide of both ecto and endo cervix, then when you run a PAS diastase on it, the diastase will digest some of it and it will leave the rest alone. So that makes it a really good control. So let's go ahead and start a sketch there. And let's say we got a piece of Endo to ecto cervix. Just kind of go down along the edge of it here. Let's, let's say right around here is going to be our uh, transformation zone that goes from our uh, columnar to our squamous epithelium. And so we're going to have all those, all this columnar epithelium in the endo cervix. And then you're going to see squamous epithelium in the ecto cervix. And the reason why this is important is because the glycogen in the squamous epithelium is the only thing that is this PS positive there. So this is essentially going to go away if you hit it with diastase. Up in here, you have a mix of some glycogen, but also other PAS positive substances, and so those muco substances will actually stay after the diastase uh, goes through. Now, as far as procedures go, uh, it's almost exactly the same as our regular PAS, H, except we're just going to put the specimen, or at least one of the slides, into diastase first. So we're just going to kind of look at this as if this is our diastase positive, or our diastase slide. So we're just going to put it in the diastase. That's going to get rid of all the glycogen here in the squamous epithelium. Okay, so this is no longer going to react. If we did not put it in diastase, all of this would be positive. So because this is our diastase one, we're just going to ignore this when we're coloring it, and the, the, all the mucus, uh, all the mucus substances up in here are still going to be positive for PAS. So as we go through, put it in diastase, you're going to wash it off. And we're going to put in periodic acid, which is going to oxidize all of the, the mucus up in here uh, to form aldehydes. Then we're going to wash off the, the periodic acid. Then we're going to add our shifts, which I usually use an airbrush for. And we put that on a new layer. And as we said initially, you're going to see just some spotty PS reaction. Uh, before you run it through the tap water. So then we're just going to go ahead and run it through the tap water. That's going to color us in. And the the mucus tends to be pretty dark. I mean, possibly even just a little bit darker than the, uh, the glomerulus. Because, once again, that glomerulus is very, very sensitive. So it works when it has good reagents and does not when they are not good. Uh, the mucus here can be pretty, pretty forgiving, so it's going to give you a very, very positive staining there. 
Now, once again, we're going to ignore this because there is no, nothing to stain because there is no glycogen. So this PS is not going to touch anything that is that doesn't have aldehydes in it. So we took away all the aldehydes by digesting it with the diastase. So we're just going to ignore all these the squamous epithelium uh, and go and continue washing the shifts until it's done. And then we are going to go to our hematoxylin, which really, when you do this, uh, it's really hard to see the uh, the nuclei because it is just so deep, deeply stained with the PAS and that mucus. Uh, but you can see a few sometimes. So we're just going to put those nuclei in there with our hematoxylin. And you might, you might not even be able to see this, but we're just going to go ahead and do that just because this is still part of the procedure. We're still going to do some staining. And you'll likely see things that aren't stained. And you'll still see nuclei in the squamous epithelium. Okay, because there's still nuclei there. We haven't completely obliterated the cells. It's just that they don't contain the glycogen anymore. So you're mostly just going to see the nuclei. And you might you might see some some spread from from one layer to the other. So you might see a little bit of very, very faint PAS positive material here just because mucin tends to get around and uh, get around to different spaces. So you might even see it kind of trail down here, but it won't be inside these cells. And that's really the important part. And then once you wash off the hematoxylin, then it's ready to go. So once again, if this was not put into diastase, this whole thing would be PAS positive. Okay, so our other slide that might be our without diastase slide, this would be positive. Not quite as positive as up here. It's pretty lightly positive for PAS. So there you go, uh, PAS diastase. For our next stain, we're going to look at Best's carmine. Or sometimes you'll just see it as Best carmine. Uh, either way, you know, you're going to know what it looks like on the exam. So best carmine is essentially a, another way of looking for glycogen. Uh, it's not quite as specific as when you do APAS diastase, where you'll know where the glycogen is because that's the part where the diastase took it away. Um, but if you just if your pathologist just wanted a general idea of how much glycogen was in something, and the specificity wasn't all that important, they didn't want you to have to do two slides like in a diastase then best carmine could be a pretty good option. So for our control, we're just going to take... Oh, that was really bad liver. Let's try that again. There we go. So uh, we'll just take a piece of liver here. Here on there. And... And we're going to have a somewhat symmetrical uh, microscope here. Uh, and essentially, we're just going to be looking at the hepatocytes. So, when we're doing those, uh, they tend to be set up in these kind of plates. Uh, so, you're going to see plates of hepatocytes, and then you're going to see some blood vessels that kind of go through the, 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 uh, the liver. Um, and those hepatocytes tend to surround those, and they, they branch off. And it really just depends on where, where it was roast and um, how deep you go into the, the section will determine what this really looks like. But for the most part, what I'm really concerned about is getting some stuff near a blood vessel and stuff that is a little bit farther away. One thing to keep in mind, because we are using liver for our control, and you really, really should in a, for best carmine, uh, liver tends to lose glycogen. As it, uh, as it is outside of the body, so it tends to it tends to be broken down. So if you are going to use controls of liver, you want to get something that is immediately out of a person and fixed pretty quickly. So if you use something like an autopsy liver, you might have a low glycogen, and at that point it might uh, have a variable performance with a best carmine. So you want to get pretty fresh liver, or at least uh, freshly fixed liver for this. So in our procedure, it's, a, it's kind of backwards from our PAS. So the first thing we're going to do is stain with our Harris hematoxylin. 
Now, depending on the amount of glycogen in the liver, that's going to change how much of this that we see in the end. But it is there just in case um, we can get any kind of uh, nuclear detail out of this. So I'm going to add a layer here. And you can use that, that splat there. And this is pretty safe. For that, these tend to yeah, have a nucleus right around the middle, these parasites. So there we go. So we're using hematoxylin. And you can use either Harris or Mayer hematoxylin for this. And one of the reasons why we might be doing this first is because we are working with some really basic things. So there might be some competition for binding, because remember that hematoxin is a basic dye. So we want to get any other basic binding out of the way. And so we want to hit our nucleus first so that when the best carmine comes in, it's not trying to get on top of the nuclei as well, even though there might be enough glycogen here to just cover these up. In some cases, uh, we want to kind of get there first with the hematoxylin because if we do it afterwards, the best carmine could be on top of it already, and so the hematoxylin might not be able to compete with the best carmine. So we've got our hematoxylin on there. Our nuclei are now stained. We're going to wash that in water to get rid of any excess, and we're going to add another layer because we have now stopped that reaction. Okay, the best carmine should not interact with this too much unless there's an actual piece of glycogen covering the nucleus, which happens in certain disease processes, which might be present in your control tissue. But if not, you might, you'll probably see some nuclei here. Now, next we want to put that into our carmine solution. So initially, that's going to just cover everything. Um, so this is something we have to actually differentiate the excess from. So for our best carmine, it's almost a little bit closer to red, I think. It's a, it's a little bit around there. And it is, once again, uh, pretty soft. So, uh, so initially, this would be just all over the place. Um, but what I try to do is remember that they're going to have pretty high concentrations of glycogen right around this, this central vein here. And everywhere else, too, there's still, still glycogen in these hepatocytes, but it is really, really concentrated around the uh, central vein and a lot of the blood vessels that you come across in uh, liver tissue. So it's going to be here. <coughs> and that's relatively close to what you're going to see after differentiation. Now, if we want to simulate differentiation here, we could. So uh, by doing that, I would, I would just color in all of it. So this is what you would see right after you put it into your carmine solution. It's just gonna be super, super red everywhere. Like I said, this is a little bit darker, a little bit more towards red than our uh, shift reagent. And then to simulate our differentiation, so we have a differentiating solution in this one, which is um, ethyl alcohol, methyl alcohol put together, and that just kind of gets rid of any any of our excess. So then we can just kind of use an eraser. Uh, I put it at half opacity to get rid of the extra. So we're going to do our differentiation here. And I'm just going to kind of ignore the edges here because it's going to stay. Right, right around that, that portal, or that uh, central vein, rather. And around here, it's going to get rid of all that excess. And it'll likely leave our, uh, our nuclei alone. That's a little bit harder to, <laughs> to simulate with an eraser, but you kind of get it. And like I said, if, you're, if your liver has certain disease processes, so some sort of glycogen storage disease, you might just not see any nuclei. It might just have so much glycogen in it that you don't see them anymore. And also, purple versus a dark red doesn't uh, make a great contrast. So even if it's not covered up, you still might have trouble seeing these nuclei. Though you should see kind of a blank space, unless you have a, uh, a disease process getting in the way. 
Okay, so uh, that's essentially what you'll see. Uh, after your differentiating solution, you rinse it in alcohol, and then to 95, and then you go down through your, your normal uh, alcohols as xylenes to cover slip, and that's your best carmine. So just as a general note, when you're studying for the HD exam, uh, one thing that you might come across is a, a color plate, so you know, a picture of a slide or a micrograph, uh, that contains a stain where something went wrong. So sometimes that's just somebody using the wrong reagent, uh, but more often it's it's a tech has forgot a step, saying the question, you know, what, what went wrong with this? And a lot of times what you want to look at is what's missing from the stain itself, right? So like when we do, uh, when we add another layer, that's because we solidified a reaction and that reaction is not going to change. Um, so it's possible to do these steps outside of each other because of that. So in a PAS, for example, you might have uh, you might have the glycogen there, but no no nuclear staining. So if you see a PAS with only uh, neutral milk, neutral polysaccharide staining, it's only that pink, but no no purple for the, the uh, nuclei. Then you know that person omitted their hematoxylin step. Or if it's just very, very faint uh, pink staining, then maybe they used a bad shift reagent or they omitted the wash step. So there's a lot of things to look out for. And on those questions, it's best to just go through the procedure. Chances are it's either, they're either going to tell you what the stain is or you'll figure it out. And you just got to go through the procedure in your head and say, okay, what's missing from this picture? Or was there too much of in this picture? And that's, that's the best way to go about those. So next, we are going to move on to our Mayer musicarmine. And as we noted before, our Mayer musicarmine stands for epithelial stain or mucins. Oops, yeah, if I could spell. So yeah, so epithelial mucins, and essentially uh, what that means is those are mucins that are created by epithelial cells, so things that tend to be uh, glandular. Um, uh, so why that's important to a pathologist is they might be looking for adenocarcinoma. Which tends to be derived from some sort of glandular cell. So an adenocarcinoma is going to have a whole bunch of epithelial mucin. So if you get a, an order for Mayer mucicarmine, that might be what your pathologist is looking for. So for our control, uh, we're going to use a piece of colon. So it has to be unautolized. So you want to have something with the epithelium intact. So if we have colon here, and we just took a piece of we're actually going to look fairly closely at this. You want to do this at kind of a high magnification because what you're really going to light up are the goblet cells and which tend to secrete that um, epithelial mucin. So we're just going to do a super high magnification of the epithelium of an unautolized colon here. So let's get some villi here. Actually, zoom in on those just a little bit. So our uh, so our colon tissue tends to be made up of some, a lot of villi here, and there's going to be a layer of simple columnar cells that kind of uh, make up the epithelium. Just kind of kind of outline middle of them. And those will be all of our simple columnar cells. Those might be some pretty big ones at the top of that one. Uh, and then this connective space in between here is our lamina propria. And if we went farther down, we might run into the um, muscularis mucosa. So it'll be kind of down here. 
And if we went any farther, uh, you might run into the submucosa, which would be underneath. And you might even see some, some lymphatic nodules, which are kind of bump out of the side here, or might be like pretty close to the lamina propria. Those just be filled with a lot of nuclei. So that's our general outline. Um, of course, we know they're columnar, they're be kind of kind of long, and the nuclei tend to be somewhat polarized. So um, at least what I've seen in in colon, they tend to be uh, near the bottom, all of the, the uh, nuclei. But anyway, that's our general outline. So I'm just gonna layer on top of that, and we can do some staining. So with mucicarmine. Uh, in my experience, we've always just bought pre-made mucicarmine for the labs that I've been in, though you can make it on site with, with the uh, base materials. And the process is pretty involved, and so I'm not going to give a whole lot of pointers on that because I haven't done that personally, and chances are you're going to either follow the manufacturer's recommendations or you're going to follow the procedure in your lab specifically. So let's just say our mucicarmine is made up. Then we have our Weigert iron, iron hematoxylin and uh, cementinol yellow. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to put our we're going to do our general deparaffinization, and then we're going to put them into Weigert hematoxylin. And so why would we use Weigert hematoxylin, and why would we do it first? Well, Weigert hematoxylin is an R iron-based hematoxylin, and it's really robust. So when you're using a stain that might take away your hematoxylin staining. And it's also saying that you can't put the hematoxylin on last, maybe because of some sort of binding. Um, you're trying to, to not try to outcompete another stain. Then you put an iron hematoxylin on first because it's going to stay unless you do some some pretty pretty drastic uh, destaining. So the very first thing is going to be our iron hematoxylin, and that's just going to get all of our nuclei. So it tends to be purple, but it tends to be a really a really dark purple. For, for uh, Weigert's. So, I'm going to get that one. And honestly, I'm not going to get all of these. Um, actually, this one's. It might actually, you know what? An airbrush is pretty. It's a lot closer. It's what I need. So, one thing to note uh, besides being able to sustain epithelial mucins, is that our mirimucicarmine is good for demonstrating cryptococcus neoformans. And so as we're going throughout special stains, you're going to find things that stain for certain microorganisms. And those, that's really good stock for questions on the exam. So they'll say, you know, which one, you know, they'll give you a stain, say which organism does this stain for, or they might say which stain stains for this microorganism. So you see notes like that in your text, make sure to write those down. Those are that's a really good question to see on an exam. Now, in terms of what could go wrong, uh, there's not a lot with this. It's pretty straightforward. So if you saw something on an exam or said, hey, this thing's messed up, um, it's mostly going to be missing an entire step. So if there's no yellow, then either they left too much water on the slide or they didn't do a counter stain with methanol yellow. Uh, if you're missing the carmine, then they miss that entire step. Um, or if there's no nuclei, then they forgot the iron hematoxylin. Or they use something that was not an iron hematoxylin, which would not stand up to the subsequent staining. So that's a possibility. You might see no, no nuclei, and they say, well, maybe they use Harris hematoxylin, and which would lead to either faint or, or absent staining in this case. For our next stain, we are going to do an Alchem Blue. And that's going to be at our 2.5 pH. And so, of course, that means that there's going to be another Alchem Blue after this, which is going to be at a different pH. So this one stands for both sulfated and carboxylated. I mean, definitely want to write that down. Sulfated and carboxylated acid mucopolysaccharides. So as you can probably guess, when you go on to the other one, it's probably not going to include one of these groups. And that's why we have two different Alchem Blues. 
So what does an Alshon Blue look like? Well, it's going to be kind of uh, kind of similar to what we did with our mesocarmine, in that it is going to highlight uh, goblet cells and any acid muc uh, mucopolysaccharides. So any kind of glandular material is going to light up as well. And in this case, we're just going to use the same base. We're just going to do another colon here. Um, you can use small intestine, uh, appendix, colon, anything like that. Anything that's going to have um, acid mucopolysaccharides. So in this case, we're just going to rely on these goblet cells, which are going to have some acidic mucins in there, and that's going to light up for us. So when you go to run this, this uh, stain, first thing we're going to do is place the slides in acetic acid, and nothing's going to happen to visually for a slide. Uh, essentially, why we have this step here is because a lot of times folks will reuse their Alshin Blue, and that Alshin Blue is kept at a, a certain pH. So by kind of acidifying the tissue and the local environment first, you're keeping your Alshin Blue at the same pH um, throughout uh, a, few, a few more runs. So it just makes it last a little bit longer. Because as we know, you know, keeping something at a certain pH can be, can be kind of rough without a, a really good buffer. So we put it in our acetic acid, then we're going to put it in our Alshin Blue. So our Alshin Blue is real pretty. It is almost like a... yeah, somewhere on that. And it tends to be a little bit more grainy. So, like I said, mucins tend to be kind of this like uh, gooey, stranded structure, and it's kind of hard to to draw that sometimes. Um, but yeah, it tends to look kind of grainy, a little bit more grainy than it did with the mesocarmine, uh, for whatever reason. So there we go. Just gonna get the uh, the goblet cells here, but it really it really pops when uh, especially when you get close to it. If you had it on the outside here, it'd be like that. But you know, I, I put the opacity the whole way up on purpose because uh, yeah, because it's it really really does pop. I got ahead of myself there and forgot to add a layer, so uh, I had to go back and just redraw some of those on their own layer because you know, we can't really draw on the uh, the outline because that doesn't actually exist. Like I said, the distribution of goblet cells uh, can vary depending on what kind of tissue you're working with. So over here we had a whole bunch. Um, the other side might not be so much, and like I said, if you're lucky, you're going to get some some like spillage out of the uh, outside of the tissue there. So here we go. We have our, our Alshin Blue is now stained our both sulfated and carboxylated acid mucin polysaccharides. Now how? How did that work? What was the, what was the mechanism there? Well, we saw this is at a 2.5 pH, and the reason for that is not so much about the Alshin Blue as it is the tissue and the, the, the mucopolysaccharides. So at the pH of 2.5, both sulfated and carboxylated acid mucopolysaccharides are ionized. And so when they're ionized, they're able to form a salt liquid linkage or an, an ionic bond with Alshin Blue. So essentially we're, we're manipulating the pH to make these easy to, to link to. So once they're uh, ionized in that 2.5 pH, the algae blue comes along and just attaches itself uh, by, via a, an ionic bond. And so that way when we do um, subsequent staining, uh, then we are going to, these things are gonna stay in place because they are now ionically bonded, which is a pretty strong way to uh, bind a dye to tissue. All right, so now that we've stained these, uh, you will wash them in 3% of the acetic acid to get rid of any excess. Um, and so we're just going to simulate that, that has already happened. And then we are going to wash them in uh, running tap water and then in distilled water. The reason for that is we want to change that acid environment back to a neutral one. So we don't want all of the all of these uh, ionic bonds to kind of stay open and, and easily changed because we're going to put another stain in here and we don't want the algae blue to compete 
with that counter stain. And in this case, our counter stain is nuclear fast red. Now, when you hear nuclear, you probably think nucleus, in which case you would be correct, assuming that that's what we're doing. So uh, you get kind of a red, maybe kind of almost a pink, pinkish color. So it's not going to be red, red, but it's not going to be pink so much. And we're just going to get in there and get the, the nuclei and also some of the spaces in between. So it's mostly there just to get the nuclei, but you're also going to kind of color everything else. So we're going to add a layer because we stopped this reaction on the end. And you got kind of a bigger brush there. Yeah. So yeah, this is what ends up happening though, is the fact that it just kind of kind of gets hits everything with red and then it'll hit the nuclei a little bit harder with it but uh, for the most part everything's kind of a red color when you use nuclear fast red and that's not really a problem you're not, you're not uh, really looking for nuclei so much with the stain as you are the, uh, the presence of those uh, carboxylated and sulfate mucopolysaccharides uh, it tends to hit a little bit more a little bit harder in the uh, columnar cells because that's just kind of how they tend to absorb it. And then you'll see it just a little bit, a uh, little less there. Ooh, that is not what we wanted. Yeah, there you go. So it'll kind of look like this everywhere else, kind of the lamina propria. And um, in the mucosa muscularis, it's just going to be kind of interspersed amounts of nuclear fast red. Because, you know, there's nuclei there and, and the spaces tend to fill with it as well. You might see some more intense staining here around this, uh, this nodule. Okay. Uh, and, and just to illustrate with any of our stuff, um, obviously these lines aren't going to be here when you're staining, right? So you can kind of take away that last layer and see only what you'll really see here and that's just what you stain so yeah when you're staining you're probably going to see something like this um, now granted when you zoom in on something like this it's going to be a, a much more uh, brighter blue but at low power it can be kind of look like this uh, so you can see your, your goblet cells with their mucin is going to be that bright blue everything else is kind of this this new fast red and that is your Alcian Blue 2.5. Our next stain is going to be Alcian Blue again, but it is going to be a different pH. So in this case, there we go. Helps when you select the right, uh, right layer. So in this case, this is going to be at 1.0 pH. And what that does is it changes the environment that the tissue is going to be in. So it's going to change what ionizes and what doesn't. So in this case, it only shows our sulfated acid mucopolysaccharides. So our carboxylated ones are, are no longer ionized at that pH. It's gone a little bit past their isoelectric point. So we're only going to see sulfated acid mucopolysaccharides. Now, what does this mean in terms of staining? Well, it's mostly just going to, uh, for us, for our, our sake, it's really only going to change the blue, and that is just going to take some of it away. Because this blue is a mixture of both our carboxylated and sulfated polysaccharides, so it's just going to be a little bit more faint for us. Now, obviously, for our pathologist, it's going to be a big difference in the patient tissue. In terms of control, it's just like a 2.5, except you just gonna have less of that Alcian Blue staining there. So for our purposes, that's about it. Uh, in terms of the, the procedure, it's very, very similar, except instead of acetic acid, we are using hydrochloric acid, which is obviously to, to change the, uh, the environment from a 2.5 to a 1.0 pH. One thing to note about that, because we are changing the pH, uh, at the end of your Alcian Blue step, whereas normally we would just wash them off, by washing them we are grad gradually changing that pH from 1 back to something closer to 7, 
And if we, we did that, then eventually it's going to go from 1 to 2 to around 2.5, and then we would start hitting our uh, carboxylated uh, acid mucopolysaccharides again. So in order to bypass that, we blot these dry after the ocean blue step, and then just hit it with the nuclear fast red immediately. And that's to stop it from hitting that uh, 2.5 uh, pH. And after that, you can wash them. Now, as we said with some of our other stains, finding epithelial mucins can be pretty important uh, when we're doing these kind of things. So <clears throat> one thing to consider is doing an Alishan Blue that is selective just for uh, epithelial mucins. And the way we do that is by doing an Alishan Blue. And this is at the 2.5 pH. Uh, with its hyaluronidase. And it's going to be a lot like when we did uh, PAS with diastase, where we're going to essentially digest away the things that we're not looking for, or perhaps the things that we're trying to find the presence of. But in this, in this application, most of the time, you're just trying to get rid of anything that's not epithelial mucin, while still using an Alshin Blue as your stain, which is understandable because Alshin Blue is, is very bright, um, the contrast is really great, and uh, it's a little bit less complicated than running some of our other stains. So in this case, uh, the, the, the big difference is a lot like when we did our PS diastase, where we're going to do essentially the same procedure, except we are going to start with a digestion step. So we're going to have our two slides again, and one's going to be with our hyaluronidase, and one is going to be without. And so when we do the one that has the hyaluronidase, um, that's going to get the digestion, and the other one's just going to skip to a normal Alshin Blue at uh, 2.5 pH. Now, when we're picking a control for this, we want to pick something that has a lot of hyaluronidase to make sure that that's what we're getting rid of. And so, let's see here. Let's see if we can get rid of this. And it looks like I was on the the wrong layer there. So yeah, so we have our thing here, and we're going to use a a piece of umbilical cord, and so you'll see a marked uh, difference between one that was treated with hyaluronidase and one that did not. And so this is uh, fairly easy to, to color in because it's going to, I'm actually going to do a uh, just a side by side as if we were doing both of these at the same time. So we're going to have the whole thing be umbilical cord, one is the side with the hyaluronidase and one is without. And so let's just do the one without. So that's going to be completely stained as an Alshin Blue. So let's get an airbrush here. Actually, watercolor is pretty good for this, I find. And when you're doing something that's like local cord, it tends to be a little bit on the lighter side, like that. That is a huge brush. So this is without. So you're just going to see just all kinds of uh, layers of, of mucin throughout the whole specimen here. And as you know, in vocal cord can be kind of, kind of a jumble of things. So you're just going to see a whole lot of that, that, that really bright blue throughout the entire thing. And that's because we haven't digested any of the uh, hyaluronidase. Of course, when we go to the uh, nuclear fast red, then we're going to see all those nuclei. I'm actually going to just use an airbrush for that. So essentially that's what you should see on the one that is not treated. Now the one that's treated, 
it's still going to have color. Uh, it's still going to be there. It's just going to have, um, it's just going to be a lot lighter, right? Because the hyaluronidase isn't getting rid of all of the things that same with Alshin Blue. So it's going to end up almost being like a uh, sea green, and it's going to cover almost the entirety of the field of view. And for whatever reason, the hyaluronidase seems a little bit more globular. I'm not uh, very well versed in the, the chemical structure of hyaluronidase, but whatever's left behind after you do that digestion uh, seems to be a, a bit more um, a bit more smooth, a little less globular. So it looks more like that color when it's all done. And then you still have your nuclei. So it'll show up with your uh, nucleophast red. And that's essentially it. So you'll, you'll be giving your pathologist two slides, uh, one with a uh, hyaluronidase digested control with the patient, and the other one without, and they can tell uh, what is uh, all of your acid mucins and then what is just the um, epithelial mucins, which will be on the hyaluronidase digested slide. So if you'll remember when we were talking about the PS diastase, we had said that um, endo and ectocervical uh, tissue can kind of show the difference between uh, different types of carbohydrates that we might come across. And that's really well shown when we do an Alshin Blue and PAS hematoxylin. So when we do one of these stains, we are really just combining the two stains. So it's an Alshin Blue, and it's at 2.5. That's usually just kind of implied. But it's a 2.5 pH, and we're also doing a PASH, or PAS hematoxylin. So, and why I bring up the cervix is that, that um, endonectocervix specimen is a great control for this. So let's just call the uh, transformation zone about there. So we have our columnar epithelium here, and we have our squamous epithelium here in the ectocervix. So endo here, ecto here. Okay, so the reason we use these is because they react differently. Uh, when we do PAS versus an Alshin Blue, and we do both at the same time, then that difference is, is a lot easier to see. So uh, in order to do this combination stain, uh, we actually do a, an Alshin Blue first. Now you're going to see uh, some uh, much more dead staining than we saw in the uh, the colon control, just because it's it's much more concentrated in the endocervix, so it's going to be kind of this whole all of this columnar epithelium is just going to be that uh, that Alshin blue color. So look at that. It's made that a little bit smaller, and I'm going to add a layer here. And layering is going to be kind of important for this one because we have a lot going on. So let's say we did our Alshin Blue. So we hit it with the acetic acid to maintain the pH. Then we use our acetic acid, and then we differentiate it with more uh, acetic acid to get rid of the extra. And you're left with something like this. So notice that the Alshin Blue only hit the endocervix, and I left the ectocervix alone because this is all neutral. This is mostly a uh, neutral uh, carbohydrates here, and this is where all of our acid ones are in the endocervix, because there's a lot of uh, mucin, a lot of glands. You might even see some outlined like this in your cross-section. So yeah, so at this point we've done our Alshin Blue portion. Next we're going to do our PAS. So we're going to do that just like we normally would. Um, we, we're going to kind of separate these by running everything through uh, through tap water and distilled, thus halting our Alshin Blue reaction. And we're going to go right into our PAS. So we're going to hit it with periodic acid, which obviously doesn't change anything around here, but it will um, oxidize all of our neutral uh, polysaccharides in our ectocervix. And then we're going to put our shifts on it. So, had a really good one earlier, but... 
We'll go with that. Okay. Put that there. But also, I'll put it up here. The reason for that is the endocervix has both neutral and acid mucopolysaccharides. Okay, so it has a mixture of both. And because we are coloring things in kind of a, a, a dot pattern when they're close to each other, so if you see two colors that are very close to each other, those, your eyes are going to mix the two colors. And so we get kind of a purple going on here um, in the, the endocervix, whereas the ectocervix stays that, that kind of bubblegum pink. And at the very end, uh, after we have uh, run in tap water to make sure our coloration is all, all good with the PAS, then we're going to add our last layer, which is going to be our hematoxylin. And that's just going to be our nuclei. And of course, we're, we're just kind of ignoring all the other stuff here. I mean, you're still going to get staining in other parts of the, uh, the tissue. But the things you really got to pay attention to are around here. Now, as you can see, when you go to add nuclei, it's they're kind of hard to see up here in the endocervix. Everything's kind of purple already. And so hopefully, you know, your pathologists are, are obviously going to be aware that um, uh, by doing this, that you're actually not really looking for a whole lot of nuclear detail here. You're mostly just uh, trying to tell the difference between the, the polysaccharides that are present. All right, so you might see them out here. You might see some nuclei around there. But that's essentially it. So when you run this uh, on an endonectocervix control, you're going to first see the Alshin blue on the endocervix. You shouldn't see much on the, the ecto. And when you get to the PAS portion, the ecto is going to turn that bubblegum pink. The endo is going to turn kind of a pink to a purple as it mixes with the Alshin blue. Now, granted, keep in mind that the Alshin blue and the shifts aren't necessarily mixing chemically. It's just that they're labeling things that are next to each other. So you have a, a thing that's pink being ne labeled next to something that is purple. You have some pink there, and you have a, or a, something that is blue, rather, next to it. And it's just the fact that they're so close to each other that you can't really tell where one stops and one ends, and so your eyes kind of put them together and make a, a purple. For our next stain, we're going to do a, uh, do that in a different color first. <laughs> we are going to do a, a Mueller Maori colloidal iron. So when you're looking over your your huge bank of special stains down the road, and we have all these under our belts, keep in mind that the colloidal iron in this is a a reagent, and it's not something that we're trying to de detect. Okay, this is a, a carbohydrate stain. So down the road, we're actually going to be using a stain that uh, stains for iron, and we're actually going to be staining for it here. But that's because this is a reagent, and that is not the purpose of the Mole Maori uh, procedure. So there's something to keep in mind down the road. Uh, also, something special about this is it is also good for Cryptococcus. You know, formins. And so this one is going to take a uh, yet another approach to showing us our, um, our mucopolysaccharides. And it's going to demonstrate our carboxylated and sulfate, sulfate of mucopolysaccharides, uh, a lot like our Alshin Blue 2.5. Uh, but in this case, instead of changing the pH to allow a, uh, an ionized uh, dye to attach, 
uh, we're actually going to impregnate the tissue with iron and then detect that iron, um, which attaches at a low pH as well. So we're still doing the pH trick. It's just uh, we're going to attach something different rather than doing an ocean blue. Uh, we're going to attach our colloidal iron to our tissue. So uh, the way we go about this, uh, we might want to pick a, something similar to what we used before. So I would say another colon probably is, is pretty good, pretty good for demonstrating this. So goes villi again. And you know, we have our lamina propria and maybe some um, mucosa muscularis here. Uh, the important part being all the, the goblet cells, right? Our colon is what's going to demonstrate those um, mucopolysaccharides. So the end product is pretty close to an alchem blue, except it's a little bit less specific, um, but it will show up those cryptococcus neoformans. So maybe that's uh, something that you're looking for. So in order to do this one, uh, we're going to do our, our normal rundown to, to water, but then we are going to rinse them in acetic acid. And so that's essentially the same thing we did with our Alchem Blue, where it's going to prevent the uh, colloidal iron solution uh, from being diluted if you use it multiple times. I'm going to put it into your colloidal iron solution. And you're going to throw it in there, and you're not going to see a whole lot going on uh, in terms of color at least not what we're going to be looking at at the end point. And then you're going to rinse it just like we did with our acetic acid. You're going to rinse that out with the, or with our ocean blue, you're going to rinse it out with the acetic acid to get rid of the, the extra. And then we are going to do the stuff that actually detects what we put in there. So right now there's iron in all of the goblet cells, but we, we don't have any way of detecting it yet. So we are going to then put our slides in a ferrous cyanide hydrochloric acid solution. And that's where the coloring really happens. So this is going to show us where all the iron is and where the iron is, is also where our mucins are. So it's kind of like our PAS where we didn't really see a whole lot until we washed in the tap water, got rid of that sulfurous acid, uh, this is pretty similar. So we're just going to kind of mark the tissue in a way and then detect those markers with something else. So we put iron in our goblet cells and then we use the, the uh, ferrous cyanide hydrochloric acid in order to show where it is. And that's where you get the most intense staining. And then we're just going to wash that in tap water so it's just to stop the reaction. And then we're going to use our nucleophast red again. So it's going to look fairly similar to what we saw with our Alchem Blue. It's just uh, with a slightly different result in terms of uh, specificity and that uh, the Cryptococcus neoformans uh, compatibility. So we'll just put our our nucleophast red in there. This will be a bit more intense in the epithelium, and then just kind of have it dispersed throughout the uh, lamina propria and the mucosa muscularis. Okay, uh, let me get rid of our. And then that's pretty well it. So when you include iron, then it uh, shows a very similar result. You can see all of our goblet cells here, and that contains our mucin. And once again, that's different because we changed pH just like we did with Alchem Blue, except instead of attaching a dye directly, we attach a colloidal iron to those mucins and then show where that iron is by using the, the potassium ferrocyanide. And hydrochloric acid, which turns it blue. So this presents a bit of a problem because what if the patient already has iron in their, their tissue and so we make that show up with the potassium ferrocyanide and we think that that's mucin when in fact it's just iron that was already there. It's not actually marking anything. Uh, so what we can do is run two slides 
Uh, and in one of those, we are going to omit our colloidal iron step. So we're not going to impregnate it with anything, and then we're just going to run the potassium ferrocyanide through it to detect any kind of iron that was already there prior to staining. That way, the pathologist knows that all of this is indeed mucin, and it's not hemocytorin, which will contain iron. The next thing that we're going to try to stain today is amyloid. And amyloid it can be think, thought of as kind of a uh, kind of a leftover substance that, that tends to be deposited in different parts of the body. And sometimes when it's deposited too much, it gets in the way of things that are actually functioning. So you might have an amyloid build up somewhere that's trying to perform a certain function, and it can't do that, that function anymore because there's too much amyloid in the way. And so that's why our docs might try to look for it. So in terms of where we get our control, t control tissue for this stain, which will be our alkaline Congo red, uh, in terms of where we get it, it's not going to matter so much uh, as far as the site, but it will matter that it contains amyloid. Okay, so we're not really looking for a lot of uh, uh, tissue types so much as as long as it contains amyloid, then that's going to be good for us. So this is our Kongu red. And so the, the staining procedure is pretty easy. Um, there's two main stains going on here. We're going to have a Harris hematoxylin and we're going to have our Congo red. Uh, in the procedure that I'm looking at, uh, the hematoxylin comes first, which means that when your Congo red goes over it, it's not going to take over any of the nuclei. Um, I've also seen it the other way, where you do the Congo red first and then counter stain with hematoxylin for any nuclei that are left over. I think it probably depends on what you're trying to prioritize in terms of uh, what your lab might pick. Now I'm going to add a layer here because there is a part of this where we're going to be using a polarized light. And the thing about polarized light is well, it doesn't make everything dark, that's for sure. Um, so polarized light tends to make things just kind of a gray when you get to the right uh, polarity. So you kind of want to use a polarizer. There we go. Um, if you've never used a polarizing light before or on a scope, you want to get your light to the point where it's kind of between your normal light and something else. And that's usually where you are going to find uh, what you're looking for is when those planes are perpendicular to each other. So we're just going to kind of work on this as if we have our polarizer set up exactly how it should be. Now, first we're going to use our Harris hematoxylin. So that's going to be our purple here. And let's just throw some nuclei in here. And I'm actually going to add another layer here. Um, but yeah, you're, you're kind of seeing them, uh, you know, not the greatest uh, visibility because you are looking at it through a polarizing lens. So it's kind of half dark, uh, depending on which way they're facing. And so we hit with our hematoxylin. We're going to run, run that through some water, which will stop that reaction. And then we're going to put our sections in an alkaline salt solution which is essentially just, just making it basic enough so that our Congo Red can attach. So after that, you know, nothing's really happening yet. We're going to add our Congo Red. And the thing with Congo Red is that we get a kind of a, they call it an apple green birefringence, meaning that it kind of goes between a couple of colors um, and it tends to be kind of a shiny kind of uh, a, a color. So um, amyloid tends to be kind of fibrillary. So you're going to see a lot of fibrils there. And you're going to see some of this. Some of this like, it's kind of green here. And you'll probably see some yellow as well. And the thing to remember is because you're using a polarizer, this 
the important part that you're really looking for is going to kind of come and go depending on how you rotate that polarizer. So we can kind of, uh, we can see if we can sort of imitate that. Right there. So yeah, as you can see, as we change the opacity here, um, as you move the polarizer, the things that are that are being illustrated to kind of come into not into focus, but they show up because you're lining up the polarizer with the uh, with the actual fibers themselves. It's kind of hard to explain, but essentially, you want to spin your your um, Polarize them around until things show up, and, it, and when you see them, you'll see them. You'll know to stop. Uh, one thing, to, one other thing to keep in mind is because you're using a polarizer, uh, it sometimes takes a, more light to actually see anything. So I've seen folks use uh, scopes on a, a lower light setting, which I tend to like. But when you're doing with polarized things, you have to actually up that so that it goes through the polarizer and is still able to um, resolve some sort of image. So if you're doing a Congo Red and you're using a polarizer and you don't see anything, don't panic right off the bat. Try increasing the brightness of your microscope and it might show up. Uh, if it still doesn't show up, then yeah, you might have uh, had something without any amyloid or you might have missed a step. Another thing to keep in mind when doing a Congo Red is when you're cutting your actual control tissue and your patient tissue, you have to make sure that you cut it at a, a thickness of 8 to 10 microns which is typically different from what we uh, cut things at. So I'm going to set that at, at uh, 8 to 10. And the reason for that is you don't get the birefringence without that. So you might get a false negative. Um, it also tends to change colors. So if it's too thin, you might actually get more of a red color on your amyloid. And too thick, you get that yellow, which we kind of showed here a little bit. Um, so you want to get somewhere in the middle to get that, that green birefringence, which is characteristic of amyloid. So our next method for finding amyloid is crystal violet. Now crystal violet is not used so much today because it is not quite as specific as uh, Congo red, but it's also it's pretty quick and easy to do. Uh, it's basically just one step. Uh, you, you take your slide and put it in crystal violet and then and mount it. Um, you might want to cover the edges of the color slip just to make sure that it doesn't uh, gain dehydration and it can kind of change colors um, because it's considered a polychromatic or metachromatic stain depending on who you ask. So let's just say we got, I don't know, a piece of kidney and we had like a, some blood vessels there, maybe a glomerulus. Maybe some tubules over here. And what's going to happen is we're going to put this in our crystal violet. And depending on what it touches, it's going to change uh, what color the crystal violet changes to. So it's going to change, or it's going to stain different things, different colors. So let's see. So let's say like, something like the glomerulus is just going to be pretty dark. Dark and, and kind of grainy sometimes. Um, also depends on what you're staining, of course. But yeah, so you're going to see like some pretty dark staining on most of this stuff. Um, but, you know, maybe in like the tubules, you might get some dark staining there. But the thing you're looking for is kind of a, a rose. So let's get closer to a rose there. Yeah, kind of a rose pink, but you're going to find around the blood vessels because the blood vessels will sometimes deposit amyloid. Now granted, I wouldn't just take a section with blood vessels in it and say, okay, this is, this is uh, amyloid positive. Uh, you definitely want to screen your stuff first to make sure that it's actually, it actually contains what you think it does. Um, in fact, that's going to be just a little bit lighter. But yeah, so that's essentially it. You're going to get a few different shades from this crystal violet, but the rose ones, the ones that you're really looking for on your section. 
And because this isn't as specific, it's not used as often, but it's really quick. So if you needed to, let's say, screen a bunch of cases for amyloid, maybe you're doing a case study or something, then this might be a good way to kind of uh, figure out which ones are good candidates. Or maybe you're looking to get a bunch of controls saved up, um, even though uh, it is noted that keeping too many control slides around is not a great idea um, because reactivity can change. But, I mean, you can keep uh, make a bunch of blocks and screen them with this, with this method because it's super quick to do. I mean, it really takes like five minutes in some methods to, uh, to do the staining. So you can just do a bunch of slides, and whichever one show up with this rows, then they're pretty good candidates for um, later controls. And for our last method for uh, amyloid staining, we're going to use the thioflavin T fluorescent method. Now this method isn't quite as specific as Conga Red, and it also requires a fluorescent scope. And according to the literature, even with the best filters for a fluorescent scope, this isn't quite as good. So the, uh, the utility of this method is uh, not that great. But maybe you run a lot of fluorescent uh, things in your lab, and, and this is a little bit more convenient for you. You might run this. So the way we do this is we're going to use uh, an aluminum hematoxylin first to mask our nuclei, because our nuclei have some fluorescence all by themselves. Uh, and so we're going to kind of quench that with hematoxylin, and then we are going to put in um, stain with our 5 5 and T, and then we're going to differentiate that with uh, acetic acid. So after we're done differentiating it, you're going to see these, these globular and amyloids here. And of course, you're not going to see any uh, nuclei because they've already been quenched. So essentially we're using hematoxylin not to show nuclei, but act to actually um, remove them from a stain in this point. And so under the fluorescent scope, it'll look a little bit like this, and that's your amyloid. And so that ends chapter seven, carbohydrates and amyloid. I hope everybody enjoyed uh, following along with me as I try to draw some examples for you, and I bet many of you have done a better job than I have. Uh, I would suggest doing both these kind of activities where you kind of draw in the stains, but also looking at actual stains uh, online. There's just tons of examples you can find. Um, sometimes in your lab, folks will keep really nice stains that happened over the years. Uh, try to find those and just look at as many examples as you can while at the same time not trying to get used to those images because when you take the exam you're not going to see the exact slides that you have examples for so that's kind of why this helps a little bit and also this tends to reinforce the procedure itself as you're coloring it remember the steps and remember what it would look like if you forgot one of the steps like in our fly five and t if you didn't have five five and you would see nothing on that uh a fluorescent scope. So try to keep that stuff in mind uh, and, and hopefully I provide enough insight that uh, special stains aren't just a cookbook for you. And that's something to really keep in mind because when you try to troubleshoot things, there's going to be things that will come up that I can't even cover in a lecture where you're going to have to know why these stains do what they do. If there's some, and granted some of them, we don't know why they work. So, uh, But if, if they're ones that have really well documented uh, methods, then when things go wrong, you know what makes that stain work in the first place. And so you have to see if those conditions need to be changed. Uh, so yeah, so just keep the procedures in mind, but also keep the theory in mind and try to expose yourself as much as possible to a variety of different stains. And uh, next time I'll see you in chapter eight, uh, connective tissue and muscle tissue. As always, have a good one.